Yeah. Right? Do they usually travel for? No. When's the last time you guys no, banned them? Who do? It was Brian on the other side. Well, they, they, they ban them every year now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I killed one last year. Of course you did. Mm-hmm. Your goofy colored bird. No, no, that was a different no, one. That was so a different it's the one, one missing all the tail feathers, yeah. and that's the reason he knew his bandit. He told me about that. <laughs> I said, well, I assumed mm-hmm. afterwards that's what happened. He I said, didn't know. He said, you know, uh, when they release those birds, they grab them. Yeah. And they release their feathers so they can get away. He goes, that's how I knew his bandit. Oh, jeez. When they release them, and they not have say that. it that. I said after I killed it, it was. Bandit. And he put the fan out. He says, oh, there isn't as many feathers as there should be. It must be bandit. I said it was probably bandit that year <laughs> because that's why. Obviously, I hadn't gone through a mole yet. Don't yeah. try to don't try to paint me into a corner. It's it's what's you know. Mm-hmm. It's all about insider information. Cool. So uh, what's the deal with CWA being landowners? Well, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Messerly, what's the deal? Um, <clears throat> what's the controversy there in terms of CWA and owning land and being a landowner where our portfolio is growing? Well, I think uh, early on we were adverse to just really risk adverse and it was kind of a well, philosophy that CWA wouldn't own and manage land. And I remember when, uh, you know, Bob McClanders was here, uh, we were offered Grizzly Ranch and we turned it down. Yeah, I remember that. And For what reason? Cost, operating costs, and again, just being risk averse, not right. not being landowners, not, not uh, you know, it was kind of during the downturn, you know, early on, right? Yeah, that was probably in 05, 06, yeah. something like that. Um, oh, it was that early on? I thought it was later. No, it was it was before the financial crisis oh, and gotcha. in 08. Because um, when were you guys running youth hunts and everything out there? It started in 08. In 08? Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe it was afterwards. Because we... We we started kind of, we started talking about no it was before that yeah um, makes sense yeah because we started talking about um, kind of negotiating the deal in in about '09 when Ken Hoffman um, was trying to think about you know starting to think about how to deal with his properties you know Esquan was going full steam up up north and it yeah. looked like he was getting out of the out of the marsh like a lot of people do um and we had been running those the youth hunt out there for at least a year I thought it was longer than that no um, I think because I they ran it for it might have been 07 so they ran it for one year before I came on I was I came on in 08 yeah. and basically they weren't using the club for anything at that point like there was like one member that was a friend of Ken's that would come out and shoot a blind. So, you know, they offered it to George Oberstad and we did like, I don't know, I think it was like six or seven hunts that first year. And that following year, it was like full fledged hunt, yeah. pro- youth hunt program. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Ken was getting into that, providing yep. youth hunts and he was, he was all in and kind of dedicated the club to doing that. Um, and, you know, was spending most of his time and all of his friends' time were up at Rancho Esquam. Yep. And then at the same time, Steve Bechtel was looking at, you know, divesting himself of all of his properties and just doing kind of his legacy planning and um, had Demerton. And they were trying to figure out some way to, to maintain the habitat and maintain the dog training. And they also had Goose Lake were, you know, similar situation. So we kind of had these two different, you know, mega donors of ours that were trying to figure out what to do with their properties and um, like I said, we had previously said no to the Grizzly Ranch deal because of all the risk and just not something that we had ever done before and we weren't prepared to do it. But when the two, you know, Bechtel and Hoffman um, were approaching us to, to take these things on, we got creative um, with the help of Claude Grillo and, you know, brought the two parties together. So we had um, the Bechtel family talking to Ken Hoffman and, um, and we came up with this plan to, uh, pair private and public dollars to create this partnership so that we could actually create an endowment to, to manage those lands. So we kind of, we eliminated that risk and with the work that you and, and George did, and yeah. we had the hunt program out there with the, with the youth hunt program, I was part of the sales pitch that would create this regional conservation education center and we'd, we'd 
have this this fund that we would create um, through the generos- generosity of Steve Bechtel. Yeah. Right? Can you, can you so, speak so, to- so Steve Bechtel, um, the Bechtel family purchased Grizzly Ranch from Ken Hoffman. That's one of the... Yeah, we know, get a lot of, you yeah. know, Ken Hoffman donated to CWA, which he's been a ginormous donor oh, yeah. to CWA, yeah, but that property was not necessarily donated by him. He made it work because it was for sale for like a short bit. Didn't he like, yeah. there was like some rumors of that because we were doing hunts and they were like, you know, you guys aren't probably going to be back out here, you know, next year because we're going to go forward. And that's when you guys kind of put the whole team yeah. together. Yeah, so. yeah. So it, you know, what he sold it for to Bechtel, I don't know, um, but he was clearly part of the of the yeah. strategic partnership in the deal. But he sold it to Bechtel. Bechtel then worked with us and we purchased all of those properties with grant funds um, from the state and from the Joseph and Vera Long Foundation. Um, and when we purchased it, all the proceeds from that purchase that Bechtel received, he donated it back to create that endowment. If so that was that to creative kind of partnership. Speak bit. to the endowment and how important that is. I mean, that's not the, our only property, but obviously ex- properties are extremely expensive to manage and maintain and how important those endowments are and endowments in general, just to kind of keep us going, you know, forward with, you know, potential other property uh, purchases. Yeah. Well, um, every, every land deal that we've ever done and, and that we will do, we evaluate to inch, to make sure that it's not a, a, a risk, um, or a financial burden to the organization. Um, so those endowments are a critical part of offsetting some of those operating costs to make sure that we can balance that equation so that yeah. we're managing that risk. And that's just something that we had never really done. You know, we never tried. There wasn't a willingness to try. Right. But once we took on what we called the legacy project with all those that I just mentioned, um, the door opened, and then we lo- we've been looking for other opportunities to – you know, grow programs through land acquisition yeah. and, and owning land in fee. And we started the land trust, um, stole Kevin back from Turkey we'll, Federation. We'll get into that, we'll, we'll yeah. that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but every land deal now, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, we go through this due diligence process and really look at pros and cons, cost benefit. You know, there's this process we go through with our lands committee and our board, so everything has board approval, um, and you know it's it's a big risk assessment and and you know evaluating cost benefit of of every deal. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And for for the folks listening, if you're not watching on YouTube, the the gentleman that is speaking right now is Jake Measurely. He is California Waterfowl COO, and here coming soon, talking across the table will be Kevin Vela, a man of many titles and you can <laughs> you can determine what your title and is when talents you, and talents right. introduce talents. introduce yourself but um myself as well as the co-host jeff smith today will be reaching out and kind of digging deeper into cwa and uh kind of the direction we're going and and what it is for the future of this company as far as land acquisitions <laughs> and land holdings and and what's to come yeah i know a lot of exciting stuff especially you know for our programming, right, to own properties and and to open them up to the public is is really a main goal of ours. And I guess without the programs early on, we probably wouldn't have too many properties now, potentially with the earlier donors, with uh, the Bechtels and stuff. So it's kind of all played into the puzzle and, and where we are today. And I think that future looks pretty bright, you know. Yeah, a lot has happened over the last 10, 12 years with land. Yeah. Um, you know, the Sanborn, or first, I guess, the... Butte Creek was first, Butte Creek yeah. was donated yeah. to us, John Johnson, Simmons. Yeah. That's the reason I got hired was Butte Creek. Yeah, so yeah. that that uh, gave us a, a foothold there in the Butte Sink, and and that created the opportunity for Sanborn. Um, yep. You know, there was some uh, controversy over us actually buying Sanborn. So what is the controversy? Well, the controversy is, is you know, again, back to whether philosophically, whether CWA should be owning and managing duck clubs and using member money to purchase duck clubs or, that, land, or the, land in general. That's the right? only property that we've used our own funds okay. to actually purchase. Correct. All the other properties have been, in one way or another, not out of our pocket in terms of acquiring them. Correct. Yeah, a mixture yeah. of grant dollars and donations together. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and the opportunity there was to scale up our programs because yep. we already had a... a, a Butte Creek Island Ranch. 
mm-hmm. and the hunt program had been going full steam. Yep. So, you know, one of our strategies, our priorities was to, to create access as, you know, I mean, you're, when yeah. were you hired to run the hunt program? Uh, so I was an intern in 08 and then I think I took it on, I got out of college in 09, graduated in May. So technically, you know, 09, 2010, probably full time. Yeah. Yeah. And for people that don't know, Butte Creek Island Ranch and San Juan Slough, they share the same parking lot. So at one time they were probably all owned by one person. And, you know, back in the day it was all rice ground. People came in, paid pennies on the dollar, um, cut down all the trees, made rice. Since the area floods out all the time, it, it wasn't good rice ground. So then they started converting them into duck clubs. And those duck clubs, over time, kind of got diced up into smaller clubs as people probably didn't get along with a bunch of you know other folks. They just kind of got diced up. So we were able to get uh, Butte Creek Island Ranch. So then Sanborn Slough became available for sale. And that's kind of where that started. Yeah. And we saw, we saw the opportunity to scale up our programs and actually had a bigger vision where we wanted to bring back that entire ranch, which included some of the other adjacent clubs. Yep. Um, but it was a big enough, you know, challenge to, to get Sanborn that we ultimately didn't, weren't able to get some of the other properties there. But the idea was to create a, a regional conservation education center in, again, regional, in different places. Yep. We already had our, our place in, in the Sassoon Marsh with Grizzly Ranch in Demerton. We had Goose Lake down in Tulare, and then this new opportunity in the Butte Sink. So Sanborn was an expansion of that to build, you know, to scale up, build capacity. And um, there were a lot of efficiencies to gain there. Um, and it, it, you know, the, that property, you know, when we did our, our due diligence, our evaluation, very inexpensive to, to manage. Yeah, compared to some of the other, even the neighboring clubs, because, you know, pumping up groundwater from a well is extremely expensive, either if you're buying the diesel or if it's PG&E, right? Some are propane, but either way, it's very expensive, so. Yeah, so in this case, not very expensive. Right. Um, so uh, an easy place for us to grow our hunt program um, and do it where it's not a, a big financial burden to the organization. Yep. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember taking every single board member out. I took them on a boat tour when that thing was flooded. And you could see the Butte sink. Uh, yeah. You could see the, or the, the, you know, Sutter the, Buttes. the Sutter Buttes. Yep. And that's just, just not something that a lot of people get to see, you know, especially no. your average Joe public duck hunter, which gets back to the access yeah. part of our strategy and our, our priority of, um, you know, providing those things, which is one of the limiting factors for people getting into hunting is that, is that access. Yep. So access to a club like that, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impactful. Yeah. And I mean, we just did the recent habitat improvements, but I know, you know, just all of the hunters that we have and just CWA members in general that may or may not have hunted there, they're just very grateful. So there's been more positives on our end, but I know there's also been some controversies with, other folks, you know, especially Butte Sink is typically, you know, it's a private area. It's kind of a, an elite area, well known throughout the world in duck hunting. And, you know, you're kind of the new kid on the block and offering hunts to the public kind of gets people worried because they don't know necessarily what you're doing or if they're going to be hunting out there seven days a week and have about 100 guys out there. Yeah. So that was a huge worry kind of early on. And it seemed like, you know, some people shared their frustrations with CWA. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's hard because, you know, explaining explaining the opportunity for CWA yeah. and explaining our plan and how it's going to benefit the organization and our membership, um, you just can't get that message across unless it's a, you know, a one-on-one conversation. Yeah. And even in that case, some people are just like, no, nope, not into it, which is fine. We knew that, you know, um, not everyone's going to agree with everything that we do. Yeah. I mean, that's the case in anything. Yeah. Um, but the number of people that we're providing that experience to, um, you know, we talk about inspiring conservation and, and getting people into hunting. Again, you take them on a boat ride through the Butte sink. That's right. why all those guys are there. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's hugely impactful. And, and, a, a you know, most people understand that it's a huge benefit to the organization. Yeah, ab- absolutely. But going back to like, just talking to people, we had a landowner n- neighbor, you know, we saw an ad in our magazine that said, you know, 
CWA's hunt program reached 2,500 p- folks. And he wrote a very eloquent letter. S- strongly worded. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I called him up and was like, He's like, you're gonna hunt 2,500 people on Butte Creek Island Ranch. That's I was like, no, 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 no. That's throughout the whole state, man. I was like, (laughs) there's like 80 people out there a year. He's like, oh, I go three days a week, you know, till noon. I'm so sorry. And then like from that day on, like we had a super good relationship. Like every time we saw each other, you know, talking it up and just talking about duck hunting, you know, going check with duck boxes, whatever. But it's kind of that misconception, right? It's like you, they don't – not everyone knows what we're doing all the time. No, so a lot of times everyone assumes the worst, right? You're right. Oh, no, we're still 100%. getting accused of hunting it seven days a week, all day. Yeah. Which just, you know, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, you get you get dinged for that, so yeah. – which is not true. That's, yeah, yeah, super proud of all the work that you guys have done to manage that and get people out there. I mean, that's, that's huge. Well, and like you talked about a little bit earlier, you know, it, you're, it's not necessarily about killing birds. It's the experience, right? I mean, that yeah. boat ride in the dark, you got the tall, flooded cottonwood forest along mm-hmm. Butte Creek. It's just, it's epic. It's yeah. Cool spot. yeah. And the scenery is just, most people are like, that. that is so cool. That's why I support you guys because, you know, you do open your lands up where you don't, you wouldn't, you don't have to, right? There's other organizations that own land that they might not be pro hunting, but those lands, some of them were bought with public dollars and there's no public access on, on the landscape, you know, which we're yeah. trying to change that with some of those other, you know, nonprofits, but yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that we got into the land trust business, looking at all the other organizations that are using government funding to acquire land mm-hmm. and then, you know, eliminate hunting on it or eliminate access to it. It's like, you know, if these funds are out there, to go out and, and do conservation work and protect land, right? Land protection is huge. Yeah. Um, why isn't CWA in the game where we can go do it and we can do it and provide hunting opportunity ra- you know, rather than someone else do it and then cut the, the hunting off? Yeah, yeah. And let's, let's break this down. Maybe, Kevin, you want to help on this? Sure. The, the land trust business at CWA, I mean, we just started this, what, Three years ago? Probably started to get the yeah, ball rolling. We, well, we became an accredited land trust right before I came on in, and, in and September. What, what does that mean yeah. as an accredited land trust? Sure. So let me let me break down. So an, an accredited land trust just means that we are accredited through the Land Trust Alliance. Um, land Trust Alliance is kind of a sister organization to the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. To be a land trust, to hold conservation easements, especially mitigation easements, essentially you have to be an accredited land trust by the agencies. So we went through the laborious certification process to become accredited, got our accreditation in 2021, and since then we've been able to take on different types of conservation easements. So real quick, we'll get into what what a conservation easement is, because most people have no freaking clue what a conservation easement is. So a conservation easement is a... Um, voluntary, legally binding agreement between a landowner and a land trust or, or a nonprofit to maintain their property in perpetuity for its conservation values. So that can mean a lot of different things. Conservation values can mean a lot of different things. It can be natural habitat, like wetland habitat, which is obviously really important to us as a waterfowl organization. It could be agricultural habitat, um, rice, wheat, that type of thing. It could even be rangeland. Um, all those different things. And, and so what they're trying to do is essentially maintain these conservation values in perpetuity. Means that the landowner can't come through, subdivide it, turn it into subdivisions, make a solar farm on their property. And we, as a land trust, the conservation easement holder for these properties, go through and monitor and enforce the, the terms of the easement, making sure that they haven't done those things. They haven't subdivided the property. They haven't drained the wetlands. Those sorts of things. So it's really important for for us to be able to go out there on the conservation side and make sure that we're maintaining conservation and and habitats throughout the state. Um, But like Jake talked on earlier, it's really important for us to be able to go through in terms of developing these and maintain the hunting rights on them. A lot of times when conservation easements are completed, hunting becomes a prohibited activity on these. Um, And that's something that can't be changed necessarily. So we want to go through and make sure that these, these stay open to hunting, it's allowable use on the property. Uh, we may not be able to run our hunt programs on some of these, but uh, we want to make sure that they're open for hunting for, for the, the landowner to do and in, in, into the future. Yeah, yeah, we actually, on one of the properties where, that we partner with, there was a no hunting like clause that they had to 
change. It took a while. Took a long time, yeah. you know, yeah. as the government <laughs> slow, slowly, yeah. slowly goes. But slowly but surely, I think it was like a year and a half, two years by the time we started and ended, you know, where we were actually able to actually go out and hunt, which was great on the organization that we partnered with. But yeah, it was a while. But like... For a landowner, why would they want to put their property in into a land trust? Let's say I'm a farmer. I, I own a 1,000 acres of rice. I might have a small wetland on there. What's the pros of me doing that? Yeah, why so, would I want to do that? So, I mean, it, it takes a special landowner that cares about their property. You know, there's there's financial incentives in, in terms of taxes and stuff like that. Um, the main part of it is, though, that the the landowner has the passion for the property. They want to see it preserved in perpetuity the way that it is. Um, if it's someone that's farming rice and they're planning to hand that down and they don't plan to ever change that, it's it's an easy thing for them to do. Um, but also, CWA, as a 501c3 nonprofit, can apply for funds from different agencies to then purchase these easements. So they come at a value. So if you have, say you have a, a piece of rice ground for easy numbers that appraises at $10,000 an acre. Mm-hmm. Well, if you put this conservation easement on it that restricts the development of the property, it's going to devalue the property a certain percentage, right? So you say, okay, you can't ever develop this. You can't ever turn it from rice into something else. It's got to stay this. So that devalues at a percentage. The, that percentage that it devalues it is the value of the easement. Hmm. So say it's $10,000 property, you, leave, you lose 30% of the value in uh, in in because of the conservation easement. Yeah. So then that 30%, that $3,000 an acre is the value of the easement. So some agencies like Wildlife Conservation Board, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, other agencies are willing to pony up money to purchase these easements to maintain that habitat forever. And that's where we come in. You're, you're managing, making sure everyone's doing what they said they're going to do on all these properties and yeah. we get paid for that service. Is that... Yeah, so we help facilitate the deal. You know, we work with the, the landowner and and facilitate the deal between the agencies. We get we get the funding. We purchase it. We we then yeah. are the grantee for the conservation easement. And then yeah, we work with the landowner in in perpetuity. They have to pony up an endowment that essentially covers our services to go out there every year to monitor it. Write the report to the agency. Said yes, they're still maintaining this and they're still following the restrictions in the easement. Um, and then we make sure that they're doing that. Forever. Yeah. Gotcha. And that and that and the the purchasing of an easement is one route to go. You know, Kevin mentioned there's tax benefits too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you ha- we have a lot of landowners that don't want anything to do with the government. Um, but as a 501c3 nonprofit, they can just donate the value of that easement to CWA. They get the tax write offs. Oh, okay. You know, they can write it off for I think over the course of maybe five years or something. So there's another way to realize the value out of that easement besides just collecting a payment from a you know from us or a, a grant source or whatever. Yeah. So, but, <clears throat> you know, protecting that land via an easement, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is we've taken on easements that are not waterfowl and wetland easements, which, and this is another controversial, you know, thing or, you know, misunderstanding. You know, why are we in, in that business? Why does CWA have a Swainson Sock easement in Yolo County? Well, if you look at urban development and sprawl and, yeah, and changing land practices from, say, pasture and small grains to nut trees, which are, you know, ducks aren't nesting in nut trees and geese aren't going into nut trees, but pasture and grains are waterfowl friendly crop. Um, and a Swainson stock easement is generally a, a irrigated pasture or alfalfa or something like that. So we took on several of these Swainson stock easements and, you know, that was one reason to protect that type of habitat, but also to curb or, or direct or, or affect urban development um, and sprawl from cities, counties, um, or just changing land practices. Yeah. So, you know, easements can create a, a protected buffer of land around existing habitat areas. Um, and, it, and, you know, we talk about noise pollution and impacts of, of urban development on the ability to hunt and shoot in different places. Yeah. Um, and we hear guys in the Bay Area, their hunting's getting shut down because they're shooting on the Bay and uh, people in the houses are complaining. Well, as that stuff spreads out and you lose that open space, slowly you're, you're losing that ability to hunt where you used to. I mean, how many places have you guys been like, oh, I used to hunt over here or or, or, hear, or hear, hear people talk about, I used to hunt this, but I can't now because yeah. there's a house over mm-hmm. here. Yep. Yeah. So easements and land protection can help to protect that that ability. 
Well, yeah. let's be honest. We're not gaining wildlife habitat back, right? Once yeah. it once it gets converted it's into gone. a subdivision, it's not getting put back into anything, right? It's going to be that forever. Yeah. So it's really important for, for us as a conservation organization to be able to hold these easements in perpetuity and make sure that, that that's not going to happen. So, so what's the goal of CWA's easement holdings? Are we just going to, you know, keep slowly working at it and trying to gain more and more? Is there an end goal? Is there just what, what, what direction are we going with it? Yeah, we're, we're going to try to continue to grow the program. Um, right now, with one of the biggest things that's kind of on, on my list for the future is working with other organizations, working with the California Rice Commission to do a, 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 essentially a Sac Valley Rice Easement Initiative. You know, we saw what happened in 2022 when we had the big drought and we lost what we had 150, 200,000 acres of rice that was being farmed out of 560,000 acres in yeah. the Sac Valley. <clears throat> yep. That was terrifying, you know, from a waterfowl hunting perspective, from just a, a, a habitat value perspective in general, not seeing all that rice on the ground was, was something that I think shook a lot of people up. So obviously we're, we're not going to be able to, you know, fix the drought portion of it right now. Yeah. But what we can do is make sure that people, when they get in those hard times, don't convert rice into something like almonds or, or walnuts because that's what they're going to do in those hard times they're going to look to something else yeah. and and uc davis just did a study recently that there's conversion of rice to to nut trees in the sac valley at ten thousand to twenty thousand acres a year oh Jeez. wow so i mean that's that's scary stuff for, for a waterfowl person so so my my look to, my vision for the future for for the program is to not only you know grow it throughout the state but focus on some of these big rice and ag initiatives um, that are really important to, to waterfowl um, and to continue to grow it there. So we've, we've also got a couple projects that we're looking at in the Delta where we're putting conservation easements on corn ground because it's the same thing. You're, you're looking at, you know, vineyards popping up, trellised berry farms. Yeah, a lot of vineyards now in the Delta. Which is, yeah, it's know. a big change from what it was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, waterfowl key in on that area. It's, it's, it's a natural habitat area that they've keyed in on for you know, millennia. So yeah. making sure that those places don't get converted and, and changed from something that was waterfowl friendly to something that's not going to be habitable for them. And once you're entered, I mean, is there any way out? Like do, do some of those, like someone wanted to buy, you know, build another Amazon center, you know, by the Sacramento airport, is there a way for the landowner to get out or is it truly in perpetuity or is it like a huge legal battle? You know, once I mean, it's in? supposed to be in perpetuity. Yeah. Um, I've heard of of some development happening on a portion of an easement and them having to, you know, it was an easement that was purchased by, you know, say U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They yeah. had to pay the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service back a big fee okay. um, because they encroached on the easement for a couple acres for putting, you know, a structure on there or something like that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's supposed to be in perpetuity. That's great, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about some of the – positives and negatives of being a landowner from CWA standpoint? Positives and negatives of being a landowner. Um, well, pro, pro, <laughs> from, my, from my point of view, I, uh, I, I, I see mostly pros. Um, the opportunity that it creates to control the environment um, yeah. and allow Jeff and Carson and Kevin and everyone to do all the things that they do um, is huge. I mean, the cons you get into the um, uh, you know the operating costs, but again, we work through to mitigate those costs and to yeah. plan for them and have revenue streams. You know, that's what the hunt program fees and mm -hmm. yeah. um, whatnot go towards. So those things are fairly predictable, and and you can plan for those and manage for them. Um, but as a landowner, um, it creates a ton of opportunity for us to do things and, and at scale that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Yeah. Especially for programming, like prior to owning the properties, um, you know, we were basically jumping around weekend to weekend throughout the Sac Valley going duck club to duck club, um, running like youth camps where now it's one location you're not packing up everything in a trailer every time. It makes life a lot yeah, easier. We, we have our own home bases to run our hunts off of. And then we still get the donations from other people. But, you yeah. know, we have our own system now where you're right. We're not relying on other folks for their access or their property to go run our 
uh, projects on. Yeah, which is hard because, I mean, like, a lot of people are like, you know, why don't you guys have more donated hunts, let's just say, in the Butte Sink? And it's like, okay, let's take the Butte Sink, for example. There might be a duck club. They only get a couple guests a year. Like, that's the club rules. Yeah. Do you think that person is going to donate a hunt for one day when he only gets a couple guests a year and he's paying – 40, 50,000 a year. He'd rather just write us the check that, you know, whatever, where when we own our own properties, we're able to do veteran hunts, women's stuff, youth, um, research just, projects. Yeah. yeah. You know, we invite yeah, universities seriously. out. You know, one of the things that we did in, in Sassoon Marsh is we had UC Davis come out and study fish in the wetlands on our duck club at Denverton. Yeah. Yep. Peter they Moyle's had, lab. Yeah. yeah. They had never had access to any of the duck clubs down there. And there was this preconceived notion that duck clubs were bad for smelt and everything else. Well, we invite them. Come on out. Yeah. You know, we yeah. own this property. You're welcome to come out and study yeah. it. We're one of the only ones right now that are allowing the Nutria folks to stay on during wetlands because we have a regulated system. Hey, we have hunts on Wednesdays. After everybody's gone, you guys can come out and check your traps. Yeah. All the other landowners are like, no, get out. It's duck season. Yeah. So our ability to help those research projects is yeah. immense. Yeah. And, you know, in the case of the smelt in UC Davis, 180 degree view on <laughs> the value of managed wetland habitat in Sassoon Marsh. Um, you know, Peter Moyle just totally, you know, was blown away at what he found in those duck clubs and we invited him out. You know, same thing in the Butte Sink. Yeah, it's changing you know, the narrative we, now. Yeah. Yeah. We had UC Davis and Cal Trout out there um, catching salmon on Sanborn Slough. Yep. And, you know, tons of work happening right now trying to fix the fish populate, the fish issue, salmon. Um, I mean, we're helping rewrite science on our properties. Yeah. That's what it is. And and it's hard for researchers and government agencies to get access to a lot of land because they're just, you know, landowners are generally risk averse. They don't want the government in their business. They've got other things going on. Um, So there's those types of opportunities that absolutely come with us having control over the land. Yeah. And, and we can provide those opportunities, keeping in mind how it's going to benefit the rest of our members in the adjacent lands. Yep. Um, Do you see the negative? Like, what are the negatives that you see that are, are somewhat valid, though, coming from a membership or somebody saying, hey, I don't like that you guys are doing this because X, Y, and Z that we, you know, you know take into account and say, hey, yeah, we'll look into that. Um. I mean, Jeff, you're dealing with day-to-day operations on the property. I mean, what, yeah. what do you... I would say a lot of it's been, you know, it was the misconceptions early on. New person in town, what are you guys doing, et cetera. So I think it's taken a little bit of time to figure out, like, what we are doing. Even though you tell people, like, you know, we hunt until noon, we only shoot X amount of blinds, you know, it's not everyone out there all day and groups like that. Um, So I wouldn't say, I would say now it's been pretty much evened out in terms of the properties where we, you know, we have good relationships with the landowners around us. Um, everyone's kind of on the same page, but yeah, at the beginning it was just kind of new kid on the block. Yeah. What, what's going on? I don't agree with you guys. Yeah. It, you yeah. Know, owning and, land. And, and to that point, I don't agree. I think the, I don't agree part, um, is partly due to, um, our, you know, the things that CWA does is diverse, right? Yeah. Oh, We've got an so. advocacy program, education, wetlands, waterfowl, hunting, all these different things. Our membership's diverse, and everyone has their own priorities. Yeah. Um, some would like to see us put every single dollar into government affairs and our advocacy work mm-hmm. and do nothing else, yeah. right? Um, so I think that's where some of the controversy comes in. Is like, why is CWA spending mo- the money that I donated to you to go help, you know, your public lands hunter to, you know, hunt in the Butte Sink? Instead, you should be protecting my right to bear arms and whatnot, and yeah. all of my money should be going to advocacy. Um, you know, there's some nuances to all of that, and there's yeah. reasons why we have all these different programs, um, and and some understand the value of all the different programs and the diversity of things that we offer. Others do not. You know, they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They disagree with one thing, like, no, nope, gone. CWA is done. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's a frustrating thing. <laughs> that, 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 that is. I mean, you talk to guys or, you you know, you read some forms or whatever, and it's like, I disagreed with you one time on the one recommendation, and I don't like CWA. It's like, I don't agree with my parents all the time. I sure, <laughs> I sure do love them. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's one thing. So out of those one things, you're going to go send your money to a non-hunting organization that's not fighting for you. It's like, come on, get the big picture here, right? It's like. 
Yeah, come on. Hey, we're we're all can't, all we can't please everybody. We can please most people. We hopefully. sure do try, though. Yeah, I mean, we, we try we're, doing, best. we're doing so much on multiple scales, and I don't think you know the general person probably realizes that. Like, you'll see, what are you guys doing for Klamath? Here's eight articles <laughs> and video clips and yeah. videos. Oh, I had no idea. But they're the first ones to say, you guys ruined Klamath or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's like, you well, didn't fix it, so I'm not going to yeah. support you guys. Yeah. It's like, Correct. where have you been for the last 30 years? This is not something that just happened like yeah. two years ago. What are you guys doing for mallards? What are you doing for nesting habitat? Here's this. Here's this. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, we have about all the incentive programs. Incentive program. Yeah. No, I had no idea. <laughs> like, okay, well, yeah. well that, that was I mean, us. You know, it's we do a lot. And it's very difficult to communicate all the things that we do. I mean, yeah, there there is yes. a beauty to being focused on one single thing, and that's all you do. Yeah. And I do envy organizations that have that ability. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of great things that come from all the all the things that we get to do. But it's very difficult to communicate that stuff to folks. Absolutely. So, um, and and unless you can sit down and have a conversation like we're having, it's it's yeah. it's really tough. I mean, it doesn't matter how much we put on our website. Um, we're just not reaching folks, and yeah. you know that's that's frustrating. It always has been frustrating, and I don't I don't know that that's ever going to change. But um, what's well, hard to can... explain everything that we yeah. do to somebody that's like, what's California waterfowl? Like you just start explaining it to them, they're like, wow, and you're like, oh wow, we we do a lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. there is there's a ton to it. So. Yeah. Yeah, no. um, yeah. Does CWA have any new? Uh, announcements of anything exciting for people to be looking forward to here in 2023, 2024? Yeah. Um, going back to the land stuff. Yeah. Um, we got a uh, property in the old bypass. Yeah. Pope Ranch. Pope um, Ranch. Mitigation property for giant garter snakes. Yep. Yep. Um, similar like what you talked about earlier. You know, we, we take on some of these different easements that aren't necessarily you know, waterfowl centric, but they do benefit waterfowl. A giant garter snakes is a great one right there because with giant garter snakes, you got to have, you know, flooded habitat throughout the summertime. It's great for broods. Um, and typically there are these, you know, deeper channels that are heavily vegetated. I mean, it, it's perfect if you can have good grassland nesting habitat next to it. And then you've got these, you know, snake channels. It's perfect nesting and brooding habitat. So is, is this property now, owned by CWA now? Yeah, no, we, we own it. Um, and we're, we're working to get it lined up for our hunt program. Yeah. It's um, a, it's a 400 acre piece in the Yola bypass. Um, it's, you know, just South of Yola bypass wildlife area, just, you know, a quarter mile South of the Southern border of it. Um, Definitely has a lot of potential. There's some challenges we're working through, but I think it's going to be a, a really sweet property. Coming there was some so. traditional hunting there in the past as well. A lot of pheasants. So, yeah. it, was, it was always known as a place where, you know, there were a ton of pheasants. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think it's going to be a mallard duck shooter too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's that brood habitat. You know, it's an isolated, you know, piece out in the middle of what is now turning into a bunch of rice. rice I mean, country. It was, yeah. it was yeah. all pasture, but there's a lot of rice development down on the yep. South Yola Bypass. So we're going to have that 400 acre roosting spot right next to all that food. Um, and I think it's going to be a banger for us. Yeah, um, I know I've been out there before. We've got a couple of pit blinds that uh, we pumped out due to everything being underwater last year out there. So they're looking pretty good. And then there's some old standups. We'll probably have to bring some back in, but... Yeah. Hopefully by next season we'll have it up on the website for everybody to apply for, and we'll start getting groups out there to be able to see see the new property that we have acquired. Yeah, and the main reason why it's not out right now is some of those things Kevin alluded to. There's a lot going on that we're not allowed – not allowed, but managing water and blinds and safety concerns, and we just put in new, some new water control structures, so yep. it just wasn't ready – for hunt season this year, we yeah, I mean, I mean currently it's dry, so yeah. you can't go hunt it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. And, those, those, and access, you know, there's yeah. a lot of um, ownership change down there with the different, you know, adjacent landowners, and so we've got to we've got to build those relationships and get get the access all squared away, so that when we do start bringing people in, it's not, you know, we're not the bad guy in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. 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 Next pro- next year should happen. Yeah, and that excited. property was donated to us by Steve Morgan, um, yeah. which is pretty awesome. I mean, that's a, a million-dollar property essentially just donated to CWA. Another longtime donor. He's yeah. donated a ton of stuff to the hunt program over the years, uh, a lot of dove hunts. But 
Um, he was always a contact early on as a donor that was always like anything like, hey, can we do this at your place? Yep, go for it. Here it is. And it was always just very nice working with so Steve. So for maybe potential property owners that are listening, what is the benefit of somebody donating to CWA a chunk of ground? Like why, why would they not go just sell it for a million or $2 million? What's, what's their incentive of a donation? Yeah, I mean it's a huge tax write off, right? I mean you, you can pretty much write off that entire donation. It's a it's a donation to a charitable five hundred one c three nonprofit. So if if you've got you know a landowner that you know just potentially is looking at some big capital gains tax that they're gonna have to pay an offset, and they'd like to offset it with a donation, I mean that's a great way to do it to donate it to CWA to be able to uh, not only support California Waterfowl Association but also you know not have to pay a bunch of money in, in taxes to the government. Yeah. Okay. What a legacy too though, as a I think as a waterfowl hunter, knowing that your waterfowl, you know, your property is going to a hunting organization and that we intend to manage it for waterfowl and, and provide p- public access, which is going to people that don't have the opportunity to hunt on lands like that. I think that's just a, a legacy that's just phenomenal for these guys that are doing that and have done it and hopefully more, you know, in the future. Yeah. No, was, that's well said. I mean I I would hope that um, that the donors see the that CWA is a good steward of the land, yeah. and that we're going to provide all of those um, hunting opportunities that uh, you know are going to perpetuate waterfowl hunting and and all the traditions that that they grew up with and that they surely want to see going forward. So um, that legacy is huge. I mean, Absolutely. don't you want to see a Jeff Smith wildlife refuge that puts thousands of people through every year? Maybe, I'm, I'm waiting for the sign to come up maybe somewhere. When I, <laughs> when, I, when I retire, maybe you guys will name one after me, and then that will be my contribution to It will society. give you like a 20-acre piece. And just, you can just give me a blind named after me. It's fine. I mean, that's Jeff fine. Smith dub plot? Yeah. yeah. 7A yeah. at Sanborn. It's Jeff's one. <laughs> All right. Uh, that'll be on the list. I was thinking Goose Lake somewhere. Oh, oh even better oh, yeah. down yeah. there. Badger He's, unit. There's a bunch of birds down there right now. I hear. There's a ton of badger. Oh really? my god! I'll be like, down there tomorrow. Loaded, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to hear how that shoots. Year. Yeah. So again, if, if they list, shot super if, well if last year, I mean, if like if listeners don't property. know, we have a property down in the Tulare Basin, down by kind of the LA area, Kern, um, yeah, Kern County, we're, south. We're of Kern. currently doing dove and pheasant plant and pheasant hunts. We are a licensed pheasant club, and we yep. are allowed to plant pheasants out there. And we have more duck blinds open starting December 20th than we've ever had at that property. And not only are we doing the duck hunts, which there's a bunch of ducks down there, but you are also able to go shoot planted pheasants after your duck hunt, which is yeah. an Sweet amazing deal. opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So we, par- we partnered with the state on that program uh, through their Upland Grants. But yeah, in terms of like just an opportunity for those guys, I mean, people that hunt it really like it. And it's a far drive for people up here in the North Valley. But our Southern California members, Bakersfield area, um, they really like it. And like I said, Badger Almond was the first year last year that we were able to hunt it. Um, long project coming. I mean, that was always the thing. Like, Badger Almond, it's coming. And Kevin's going to fix it. You got <laughs> gonna be, it's going to be an oasis in the desert. But you got a solar. Sure. Touch on that. I mean, that's yeah. pretty awesome um, with that project. Yeah, so we recently got a, a grant from the Wildlife Conservation Board to put solar out there um, in a place. In, so that that property is in a, a wetland easement. So we had to work around, you know, the easement boundaries to be able to put um, a, a solar array out there that we're working on right now. And what that's going to be able to do is it's going to be able to allow us to use our pumps out there, our ground well pumps, to be able to flood that project whenever we want. So right now, we're really limited out there in terms of surface water. Yeah, so that's um, coming through the districts that basically a lot landowners certain amount of acre feet a year that yep. you could then purchase for that. Exactly. Them, right? Exactly. And it's really expensive. And really, <laughs> really expensive. Down there. Yeah, Not really. much water down there. It's really expensive and it's hard to get it out there. And we have to pay for this ditch to be charged and it's a whole lot of stuff. So, I mean, we, we have these ground wells out there that, you know, we we flooded the entire place with last year before we had a bunch of surface water available like this year yeah. after, you know, Tulare Lake got filled up. Yeah. Um, but it, it's that's also extremely expensive. I mean, really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's going to be fantastic when we get the solar ray out there to be able to flood it. We're going to be able to irrigate it. We're going to be able yeah. to do whatever we want out there. Service or uh, uh, water wise, it's going to be pretty dang sweet. And I man, mean, I remember going down there the first time when we were working on that deal, and we're driving <laughs> through tumbleweeds and just out in the desert, and there's not 
a drop of water anywhere. It's no man's land. And all there. the all the board members were looking at me like, Jake, what in the hell are we doing down <laughs> yeah. here? You know, they're all up from Redding, yeah. Butte Sink, yeah. and everything else. And we come around the corner at Badger, and it's just cattails in the middle of the desert, just lush cattails, can't see any water. And then the whole thing erupts. And I mean, it's there's a lot of green in there. Yeah. And their eyes get all big and <laughs> drive around it, and they're like, okay, good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Check. Check. Oh. Yeah, our our year last year at Badger Almond from December 20th on had the highest bird average out of any of our properties from December yeah. 20th on. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, just a short, it's just a short window when the birds are there. Yeah. But they're yeah. there. Yeah, we tried early on, and just the birds weren't there early on on the Houchin unit. But, I mean, that property in particular, I mean, we reconstructed – all of those wetlands, yeah. refabbed the re- the wells. There's been a ton of effort down there on those properties, but it's finally coming yeah. full circle. Well, do you want right? to talk? You want to talk about the mud? The mud. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the, mud. <laughs> the mud. Oh yeah. So the first year, well, one little issue. Yeah. So it's getting we, better. <laughs> we did get a grant to to do some rehab at at Badger, so we were able to put in pit blinds and do gravel paths. But the very first year, I would say. Uh, there wasn't any gravel, and yeah. we had some islands, and it was hard to even get to the islands. The mud was that bad, which is was shocking. But basically, essentially, you had these wetlands that had not seen any water for a long time, and you had this not a whole lot of vegetation on the soil, and it was just this sticky, yeah. terrible. Like when people talk about Mendota mud, it was probably worse than Mendota. And we mud. apologize to everybody that went out there, yeah, and we're like, it can't be that bad. And Carson went down there, was like, it's that bad. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, it was. It's that bad. It was terrible. It yeah. was some of the worst mud I've ever been. But yeah, in. like you said, first year getting flooded in a long time. You yeah. get you get that weight of the water on it multiple years in a row. It's going to dent up. Well, it's we got gravel paths. Well, even now. like all the water yeah. grass and food down oh, there this yeah. year. I was like, I was a little jealous. So like, I want some <laughs> yeah. of that. You know? Unit so, one had some epic water grass. Yeah. So I mean, that's the good news down there. It's been a long time coming. Um, I'd say that was Jake's vision. And we were like, I don't know, dude. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's finally here, but it's been you know a teamwork of people getting it together. And um, I just know the people that do hunt it uh, love it. But was it recently? Can you talk about the big don larger donation we had from a guy that? Oh, um, yeah, no, that's a great story. Um, talking about guys from SoCal, yeah. and we had a guy that that none of us knew. You know, we've got all of our databases and, you know, software on all of our donors and our members, and we do our best to track and connect with people that give. And, um, you know, it's hard because we've got 20,000 members, and um, not all of them are known to us. Well, this guy, um, he uh, he hunted at our Goose Lake property twice. Yeah. And left us a million bucks in his in his will. Wow. Unfortunately, he passed away recently, but, yeah. you know, gave us a million bucks. and. You just never know who you're working with, but he loved what we were doing at at, at the property down there, and you know, that's, need to add some add some know. gravel to that badger road well, he, with that he, million bucks. Yeah, he was uh, <laughs> he was one of the original ones at Houchin. So you know, I had some early communications with him going back in the emails after we found out who it was. But yeah, I mean, only hunted out there a handful of times. Loved it and appreciates what CWA is doing. I mean. Incredible. Yeah, incredible, well, I think, right? I think that's one of my favorite part about the hunt program is you just never know who's going to show up and the impression that you make on that person, yeah. whether even even Goose Lake where it's unmanned, like they don't see yeah. – we have we have a caretaker down there that, you know, helps us out, but he's not there checking people in, checking people out. So even on a property like that, just the preparation that we were able to do impressed him enough to give that generous gift is yeah, outstanding. Is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how many stories we have of – you know, young ad- kids or young adults that start in the program, you know, and and then the next Car- thing you Carson, know, they're... Jason, they all went to Grizzly Ranch and yeah. hunted, which is crazy, right? Garrett Gracie. Yeah, yeah. Garrett Gracie. Yeah. I mean, we just did a, uh, you know, one of our Friday features of our members, Blake. You yeah. Know, he started at one of our camps and now he's one of our, you know, running, you know, big events for us. And yeah. So there's a lot of – I mean, that feeder program, the, the things that happen in that duck blind in the field those first couple of years in our programs, um, you can see how that inspires folks, and then it sticks with them. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, running kids through Grizzly Ranch in 2012 when I first started working for CWA, it was yeah. wild, man. And it, it, the best part about that is 
every time someone goes through, they do, do the hunt, they've got that form to fill at the end, the survey, right? Yeah. And you could be a kid that comes like, out, shoots I, his, shoots give his me first ten, duck. Give me 10 out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I never said that. Yeah. But. Uh, so, yeah, they'd, they'd fill out the survey, and, and it could be a kid that came out and shot his first duck, yeah. you know, a, a girl that comes out for her first duck hunt. It could be someone that shoots their first limited ducks. Yeah. And every time on the end of the survey, is what was your favorite part? Yeah. What was the favorite part, Jeff? I would say the boat ride. Boat ride yeah. in the dark. Yeah. Every single time. Holding the flashlight. It didn't, yeah. doesn't matter. You know, it's the experience, and that's what really does yeah. it for these people. It's not necessarily... It, stacking up numbers it's it is though it's like experience. oh cool boat dock and yeah i get to go on a boat and the decoys are in the blind i get to throw them out yeah people love that stuff and it's yeah. cool for us. i mean like i grew up hunting in a boat but majority of the people have never taken a boat to a duck blind yeah right and they get to do that or a boat in blind in the butte sink it's freaking cool yeah you yeah. know it's, it's amazing and that's where we have always tried to make it like Make it make the program so if you ever experienced it, you were one of our hunters, you'd come out with a positive experience of, you know, the place looked good, people are friendly, blinds look decent, and, you know, provide a good opportunity. Yeah. Birds are not. Can, right? Control, you can control. Yeah. Control the control. I know, I mean, the, it's frustrating. The last couple um, hunts, you know, down at, at Quimby Island, there's no ducks down there right now. But it's it not looks happening. great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good. But everyone that's been there, like, I want to come back. Yeah. You yeah. know? Um, yeah. I want to come back when there's ducks. Yeah. yeah. Well, same thing. It's the adventure, right? I mean, you're taking a freaking boat. You're across taking a boat delta. ride across, across the, you know, the, <laughs> 20 miles the deep ship. Wind you know, coming across the ocean. Track. Yeah. I mean, it's an adventure just to get there, let alone you know, get on the island and, <laughs> and actually get out in the, to the blind. It's, yeah. it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean. Same thing. I mean, you have the opportunity to have a fantastic hunt out yeah. there. Um, but even when it's slow, it's the adventure that gets it for people, I think. Uh, now, Jake, Kevin, it was awesome talking to you guys, and thanks for spending the time with us here in uh, Save It for the Blind podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for having Of us. course. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in this episode at Save It for the Blind podcast. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere podcasts are found.